。上世纪七十年代到八十年代，许多拉丁美洲国家政府实施了针对本国人民的战争，他们肆意强迫失踪、实施酷刑和杀戮。这一时期，联合国人权事务方面的负责人站了出来，各国政府第一次要为自己的行为受到追究，并成为惯例。My name is Theo van Boven. I was the director of the United Nations for Human Rights from 1977 to 1982. Theo a été le premier haut commissaire avant la lettre par son esprit d'indépendance. C'est Theo qui a ouvert la voie. There was a lot of pressure of all kinds from certain governments, having their secret service agents in the corridors looking after what we were doing, following what the NGOs were doing, threatening people, putting pressure on other governments. Latin America had strong dictatorships, and NGOs couldn't mention government names in the commission for violations. It is inexplicable and indefensible for the United Nations not to react urgently to situations of gross violations of human rights. It was entirely unheard of that a human rights director would take vigorous positions. Everything that a senior UN official did was closely monitored. And so it was his great breakthrough that he decided to act and, in some instances, to speak out publicly against gross violations of human rights. There is a tendency, at that time at least, that the UN should remain low-key. Some felt that I was too outspoken. Quiet diplomacy uh, is perhaps what they thought more productive. Uh, than to speak up. Uh, I think this is a very questionable disposition. In his character of director, usted hizo algún tipo de gestión? When, for instance, the coup d'état occurred in Chile, a special public procedure was created. The military felt that they had to give the impression right on from the day one that they meant business. Therefore, they bombed the palace of government. September 11th, that was a dark day and a bit rainy. After that, I would say that the life of a whole generation of Chileans changed. The military authorities managed to take control of the whole of the country, putting in prison thousands of people. They even put them in the national soccer stadium because there were not enough place in the prisons. Son impact était très important, grâce à Pinochet. Ça peut paraître curieux. Mais quand il y a eu le coup d'État, euh, Théo a pris l'initiative, avec quelques autres, de, de créer une commission d'enquête. Et à l'ONU, on appelle ça « groupe de travail » pour ne pas inquiéter les États. C'était la première fois à l'ONU qu'une commission d'enquête, qu'on appelait « groupe de travail », enquêtait sur des violations de droits de l'homme contre un État. Oh. 
on the first day of our official visit, we had to pay a sort of courtesy visit to the head of state. That was Pinochet. He was sitting there all by himself in a, in a, in a tower in his office. Uh, the, the desk before him was clean. He accused the UN, the working group, of serving the communist purposes. This we strongly refused. It was argued that his country was known for committing serious violations of human rights and we wanted to investigate that on the spot. In fact, the general became very angry. The Chile report may well have been the first UN report that showed how the military dictatorship can destroy the living uh, standards of people. And we could see it when we went there. The international community knows through the investigations that were carried out by human rights missions from Europe, Theo van Bowen. We, we never thought that there would be the level of murder or torture or disappearance of exiles. It can happen anywhere. The next big challenge for us after Chile were the disappearances, in particular in Argentina, but in other countries too. Yo, Teniente General Jorge Rafael Videla, Comandante General del Ejército Argentino, juro por Dios, nuestro Señor y estos santos evangelios, desempeñar con lealtad y patriotismo el cargo de miembro de la Junta Militar. One of the first things that Teo did was to open his office and our office to victims and to their representatives. Meeting people who have been tortured is very different than me reading reports sent in by non-governmental organizations. In the case of my three children, tenían una militancia opositora a la dictadura. Y bueno, pero la víctima propicia fue Laura, la mayor de mis hijas, que fue secuestrada en noviembre de 1977. Estaba embarazada en el momento del secuestro y junto con su compañero fueron llevados a un centro clandestino de detención. The mothers, the madres, the abuelas, uh, they, they were very visible and well known. And... As a group of committed women, I think, who were directly involved, that, that had a great impact on public opinion. Disappeared children. The government claimed that it was all a part of terrorism and terrorist gangs. And the question was put, are these little children, are they also terrorists? Theo van Boven nos defendió, nos apoyó, se solidarizó con nosotros, luchó tanto. Era costumbre del matrimonio Van Boven recibirnos a nosotras que estuvimos en la casa de ellos. In the 70s, I was in exile in, in France after having left my country. I started to work in the struggle for human rights and I heard about uh, what was taking place here in Geneva in this, in this very same place, room 17 of the Palais des Nations Unies. There was a person working here in this place and this was Theo van Boven. For the first time an important person in the UN appeared to say, listen in Argentina something terrible is happening, we have to pay attention to that. In terms of what was the struggle to restore democracy and human rights in Argentina, that was a very important point against the dictatorship. Efforts were made in the Commission on Human Rights in 1979 to establish a working group on disappeared persons, but this was blocked by Argentina and others. Now it was a year later only uh, that uh, this initiative was successful and so it, the working group was established in 1980. Rather late, but better late than ever. 
It happened in El Salvador, in Guatemala, Indonesia, in the Philippines. We covered 15 countries in our first report. The next year, by 1981 and 1982, we could list many people whose lives have been saved because we were able to get a cable to the government telling them that we have information that this person has been kidnapped and they needed to release it. And that had worked and still works today for many, many people. He was by far the greatest human rights leader the UN has ever had. That's what I would say. I've always felt that our primary duty is towards the peoples in whose name the United Nations Charter was written. And I've maintained that whenever necessary, we must speak out on matters of principle, regardless of whom we please or displease, within or outside the organization. Y esta lucha es desde el amor. El amor es el sentimiento que nos guía a las abuelas todos los días para defender los derechos humanos de todos. Even today, governments make big efforts to stop the United Nations from investigating their human rights practices. And the question is, if it didn't matter, why would they make such an investment? We do have to care for the dignity of people, and solidarity is an extremely important issue to make the world worth living in. If the average person only cares about him or herself, then that is a world of mental poverty. We should try not to set our standards on the basis of mental poverty, but on solidarity with fellow human beings, far away or just close by. <laughs>